were expecting Brandon. Sorry. <laughs> he, uh, he called me this afternoon. He wasn't feeling real well. And, uh, or actually, I called him. I'd sent him a note uh, to wish him well tonight and tell him I was praying for him. And he said he was under the weather. And I told him that I'd just, I, I had something on my heart anyway, and I could just fill in and come on back in tonight. Uh, but I do appreciate you being with us in the service. And while I'm at it, let me say again, first of all, thank you all for your prayers as we were traveling. And, and the Lord blessed, had a really great time. Really couldn't have gone much better than what we did all week, and, and so we just praise the Lord for the time away. But I also want to thank Brother Mike Malone and Brother David Taylor and, of course, Brother Brandon uh, for filling in in the services, all the work that they did, uh, helping so that we could get away for those few days and how much I appreciate them and their faithfulness and all that kind of stuff. And, and while I'm thinking about it, just a couple of things. We're having a deacons meeting this coming Monday. That's the plan anyway. Uh, and we're going to be discussing uh, a lot of questions. People got a lot of questions about when we're going to start back up and, and start having services in the sanctuary again and those kind of things. I don't know how many of you saw it yesterday. Uh, I think it was yesterday or it was uh, maybe Monday uh, that Governor Lee has extended the mask order to the middle of September, uh, but we're going to be meeting on Monday, talking about our options, looking at what we can do uh, about maybe starting things back up here before too awful long, having services back in our sanctuary. Uh, so you just pray uh, that God would have his uh, hand upon us, give us the leadership and the direction that we've needed. I praise him uh, for the leadership that we've had, even when we had to go back uh, to the live stream only when we had that burden to do that. And then he showed what, later why that was. Uh, and so I just praise him and appreciate him so much for that. Uh, tonight, uh, when Brandon and I were talking, Starting about middle of the week, God just kind of began to burden my heart with this particular thought. Uh, and I've been trying to figure out when to do this. I had been trying to figure that out. I actually thought about maybe doing some of it as part of our morning devotions. And while I'm thinking about that, we'll start the morning video devotions back up next Monday. Uh, give me a little bit of time to get some things caught up uh, where we were out of town. Uh, but I had been thinking about maybe doing that as part of the morning devotions and, and and was kind of looking about that, and then like I said, when I talked to Brandon, and he said he just didn't feel like he would be able to do this tonight, God said, now's the time. So we're going to be doing something a little differently tonight. We're not going to be looking at our Standing on Solid Ground series. Uh, instead, I'm going to be preaching a message from Romans chapter number 1. Uh, Romans chapter number 1. And we'll start reading in verse number 18 and read down through the end of the chapter, all right? Romans chapter number 1, starting in verse number 18. The Bible says, Therefore the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affection for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and merciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. 
God's burdened my heart for the thought tonight on simply this, the signs of the times. Let's pray. Father, I ask now that you just hide me behind Calvary, clear my mind, allow me to share the things that you'd have me to share this evening, and Father, may it speak to our hearts and challenge us as believers to be about what it is that you'd have us to do. And we're going to give you the praise and the glory for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Now, I've noticed over the last several months with all of the things that have been going on in our country from uh, the COVID-19 virus to uh, the riots in the different cities and uh, all of the things that are going on with Black Lives Matter and, and the, uh, all of the dysfunction that we're seeing in Washington, D.C. And, and, and all of the things that have been going on. I've noticed over the last several months that people have posted, especially I've seen it on Facebook, that people have posted how that with all that's going on in our country today, surely Jesus must be coming soon. And while I have no doubt uh, that it will not be long before Christ returns, I'm not as convinced that what we're seeing now in our country, uh, the rampant sinfulness, the anger and the hate and the destru destruction and disregard for human life and, and so much more is not so much a sign of Christ's return as it is a sign of God's judgment on this country. Now, nowhere in Scripture do you see that Christ's return is tied to how bad things are in America. Christians in all nations suffer in ways that we as Americans cannot even begin to imagine. And there's no guarantee from Scripture that the same kind of suffering and the trials and the things that are going on in other countries won't happen here in America before Christ returns. But we do see in the pages of the Bible what happens when a nation, a, a group of people, forsake God and go on their own way. And what we see in those pages of the Bible is the judgment of God upon that nation. The pages of Scripture show us undeniably that God does intervene in nations, raising them up for a particular period of time and then bringing them down in another time. God used Babylon as a chosen instrument to judge the nation of Judah, and then he wrote the entire nation off with the fingers of a man's hand in Daniel chapter number 5. We also see God's pronouncement of judgment on many Gentile nations in Isaiah 13 through 23, in Jeremiah 46 through 51, and Ezekiel 25 through 32, and the, and the minor prophets that we've been looking at in our morning devotions. God judged Egypt in Exodus, and we see God's pronouncement of judgments on Assyria, which had been used by God to judge the nation of Israel in the book of Nahum. Like we said, and Obadiah is God's prophecy against Edom. So there's no doubt that there's a firm basis in saying that God truly does judge nations. The question is, will God judge America? Or better yet, has God already been judging America? As painful as the answer is, I believe we can see from the pages of Scripture that God's judgment really is already upon our land. And Romans chapter number 1 helps us to identify the stage of the judgment that we find ourselves in. For many weeks now, I've been studying this passage and just thinking about it and What's come from that study is really kind of a theology of God's wrath and judgment against sinful nations or against sinful groups of people. Now, I'll admit that as I've studied, there have been times that I've been unsettled in my heart and in my spirit because I'm firmly convinced that God has been progressively judging this nation for some time. It's not a matter of asking when, but it's more, of an, it's more of the question of where are we in the judgment cycle that God uses. All right. Now, the implications of this kind of study are huge, and we need to get a firm grasp on the realities that we find in this passage. 
in the message, we're going to be looking at the cause of God's wrath upon a nation. And then we're going to be looking at the stages of God's judgment and kind of see where we can determine where God or where America is in the mix. Now, in verses 18 through 20 that we read just a few moments ago, we see the cause of God's wrath upon a nation. Look at it. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that, that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even His eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Now, the first thing that we see there in this passage is that the phrase, the wrath of God. And we have to understand exactly what is that. So, simply put, God's wrath is His response of revulsion against anything that is opposed to His holiness. It is His justifiable abhorrence of sin. It's not judgment per se. It's the response of God's nature to sinfulness because He is holy. And it's that response that then causes God to act in judgment. Then we see the word revealed, and that word means to lay bare or to take the lid off of something or to uncover it. And then we come to the words ungodliness and unrighteousness. Now, oftentimes we use those words as almost synonyms, but that's not the case here. In the word ungodliness, we have the idea specifically of a lack of reverence for God. It's a non-appreciation of God's person and His power and His holiness. It's atheism, both philosophical when people say that they believe there's no God, and also practical atheism where people live as if there's no God despite maybe even giving lip service to His existence. Also, you have the word unrighteousness, and where ungodliness has to do with a lack of regard for God, unrighteousness deals with a lack of regard for our fellow man. It's any evil committed against another. It's interesting that as you look at the Ten Commandments, the first four deal with ungodliness, uh, idolatry and profaning God's name and not keeping the Sabbath, while the last six deal with unrighteousness, the covetousness, the theft, the murder, the adultery, all of those things. But then we come to the word hold. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. And the proper meaning of this word is to hold back or to restrain or to hinder or prevent. So what it's saying here in this passage is, is that they're holding back or restraining or keeping down the truth. Now, the word truth here means what's true as it's related to God and the duties of man, both in a general and in a specific way. In this passage that we're looking at here contextually, the truth that's being discussed is the truth of the existence and the power and the authority of God. That's what the sinful world or the sinful nation is holding back or restraining or trying to keep hidden or trying to push down out of the way. Now, I apologize if going through these definitions seemed a little bit tedious, but it's done with a purpose. The verse tells us in very clear terms what will bring the wrath and then the attending judgment of God upon a nation. What is it according to those verses? Well, God pours out His wrath upon a country or a people that knows God and His expectations toward Himself and other people and yet who willfully choose to suppress that truth in order to continue living in their sinfulness. Let me say that again. God's wrath comes upon a people when they know God and they know His expectations toward Him or toward Himself and toward other people and yet they willfully choose to suppress that truth so that they can go on living in their sinful ways. God's judgment will fall upon any nation 
that lives as if God doesn't exist and abuses other people and actively suppresses the truth of God from reaching others. Why does he do that? Well, verses 19 and 20 in the same passage tell us that. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, right here is one of those places where a simple preposition makes all the difference in the world and how something is understood. If you look at verse 19 in several, in several modern translations, it says that what may be known of God is manifest to them, not in them. The NIV, for instance, translates verses 18 and 19 this way, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because he has made it plain to them. Now, in the Greek, when you look this up, it is without a doubt the preposition in and not the preposition for to. And that little change makes all the difference in the world in how we understand verses 19 and 20 in relation to God's wrath and judgment. So depending on the preposition, one means that God has shown something external to ourselves while the other says that there's an internal witness to the existence and truth of God that is in them, all right? Paul tells us what that internal witness is in Romans chapter number 2, starting in verse 14. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. What this passage says is, is that God has revealed the reality of himself to people and that there is a sense of right and wrong. And that also teaches us that for there to be a right and there to be a wrong, there has to be a lawgiver who's determined what is right and what is wrong. But God goes even beyond that. In verse number 20, he says that God has revealed at least two other, two different things about himself through the general revelation of nature. He enhances the inward witness that we have of right and wrong by giving us external evidences to look at. And that verse tells us that at least two aspects of the person of God are clearly revealed by just looking around us. Number one, we look at the creation and we see His incredible power and we see His incredible um, uh, might. And then secondly, we also see His authority as God. Because if he's created it, then he's the one ultimately that we're responsible to as part of that creation. This is very similar to another passage that we see in the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter number 3, where it says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. What Peter tells us here is that in the last days, four separate truths will be denied. Number one, the creation. Number two, the flood of Noah. Number three, that there's a coming future judgment. And lastly, the, and foundationally, the Word of God. The rejection of the Word of God is seen in their rejection of the idea of the return of Christ and that He has the right to judge. And the only way that you can deny that is by denying the creation and the evidence that we have all around us that God has already judged once by the flood. The Bible says, however, that they have to intentionally choose 
to ignore. That's what that willingly ignorant means. They willing, willfully choose to ignore the truths that God has created and that He's judged in the past. That must mean if they willfully ignore it, that means that there's ample evidence that God has created and that He has judged in the past. Paul tells us back in Romans that the two things that are clearly seen are God's power in that creation and His authority to preside and, and rule as God over that creation. And Paul also says there that to do that, they're without excuse. And that phrase, without excuse, means that ultimately they are without any defense for believing that, which is the same thing as saying willfully ignorant that Peter said in 2 Peter chapter number 3. Why is that the case? Why are they willfully ignorant? Why are they choosing to ignore it? Well, because that internal witness that they have of right and wrong and that there is something that's right and that there is something that's wrong and that means that they're a lawgiver, that that evidence, they're trying to suppress all of the external evidence so they don't have to deal with what's going on in their heart. One of my favorite quotes uh, is from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And, and when Marley appears to Scrooge there in, in Scrooge's home, uh, the old miser tries to come up with a natural explanation for why he's seeing this ghost. And, and, and the ghost, Marley, uh, Marley asks him, he said, don't you believe your senses? And he says, no. And he said, why would you deny your senses? And he says, you may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Now, many would like to dismiss the internal witness of God. That conscience that tells them there is a right and that there's a wrong. They would love to write that off as bad digestion. But the intricacies and the beauty of creation deny any honest explanation other than the power and the existence of God. To deny either witness is to be without excuse and willingly ignorant. The Bible says in Psalm, 100, or Psalm 14, verses 1, and then also in Psalm 53, in verse 1, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. And I'll tell you tonight, based on the authority of the Word of God, God judges that kind of arrogance. As we look at this passage in Romans 1, verses 18 through 32, we see the three progressive ways that men try to reject God and reveal their ungodliness. And each of these brings about a particular level of God's judgment. Look at it in verse 21. First of all, we see the neglect of God. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. Neglect of God entails a lack of honor and a lack of thankfulness for His person and His blessings. But then in verse 23, we see the corruption of God and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Corruption of God entails giving something else the credit and something else the worship that are due only to God, and then remaking God in an image that they can accept. And then in verse 28, we see the rejection of God. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. When we create God in the image of our choosing, it's not long before the need for God vanishes altogether. And the final stages of God's judgment on a nation begin in earnest. Romans 1 verses 18 through 20 tells us that to deny God's existence is inexcusable, that it is ungodliness in the true sense of the word. And to believe that there's no God will encourage the sin nature into all kinds of expressions of unrighteousness. They go hand in hand. You deny God and then you live an unrighteous life. But it starts with a rejection of God, a rejection of His truth, and a rejection of His authority to tell us what's right and wrong. 
Now, here are some events that we need to keep in mind as we think about the judgment of God upon this nation and the rejection of Him as a nation. July 10th uh, through the 21st of 1925, the Scopes trial that would later be used to get creation out of school curricula. 1962, Supreme Court decision, Engel versus Vital, that banned prayers in public schools. 1963, the Supreme Court decision, Abington School District versus Shemp, banned opening the day with prayer or devotional Bible reading. 1980, the Supreme Court decision, Stone v. Graham, banned the display of the Ten Commandments. 1985, Wallace versus Jaffrey, the moment of silence was even struck down. June 2002, the California Ninth Circuit of Appeals declared the Pledge of Allegiance as unconstitutional because of the phrase, under God. And that happened to be thrown out on a technicality. June 26, 2015, in Ober Obergefell versus Hodges, the Supreme Court ruled that homosexual marriage was a right in clear violation of Scripture's teaching that it's an abomination before God. July 24, 2020, the Supreme Court ruled that a church in Nevada could not open even if they followed the same restrictions of a secular business like a casino. In the last couple of weeks, there's been a showdown of sorts in California where the governor has told churches they cannot open and that fines and imprisonment would await those who violated that order. Pastor John MacArthur at Grace Community Church has refused to shut the doors. And that situation is still playing out as to what happens next. America as a nation has been systematically rejecting God for over 50 years. Now, remember that the first stage of rejecting God is neglecting Him. They cease to be thankful or glorify Him for who He is and what he's done. So what happens to a nation when they begin to neglect God? Well, the Bible tells us in verse 22. It says, but they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. The phrase vain imaginations here carries the idea that once men cease to be thankful to the true God and cease to glorify Him as God, that their thought life gets turned upside down. The phrase literally means that they begin to debate things in their mind about God in an idolatrous fashion. Can I give you an example of that that's going on even in the church of America today? Many, many different denominations are either debating or have debated whether or not homosexuality is an acceptable lifestyle and whether they should be ordaining homosexual priests, whether they should be um, doing homosexual marriages, debating what Scripture clearly says is an abomination before God. But that's just the first step in the downward spiral. And it seems to be the step that ultimately takes the longest to actually process. People don't usually go from relying on God and trusting God and praising God to not being thankful to Him or adoring Him. They don't just do that overnight. It's a progression. And as we said, going all the way back to 1925, it was Darwin's origin of species that threw God out of the mix of the creation that began America on that path. And that's where we see the truth of verses 22 and 23. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. With the rejection of God as creator, a people or nation are no longer able to reason clearly. And the result of such unsound reasoning is to elevate themselves to a godlike status themselves. They declare themselves to be wise when all along all they're doing is showing just how foolish they are. But if you'll remember, we talked about that inner witness that there's a God and Creator, even if sinful man tries to deny it. The answer then becomes a desire since they can't deny God. They try to corrupt God and they turn Him into an image that they can accept. 
over the centuries that resulted in animal gods, such as those that were worshipped by uh, uh, native peoples and aboriginal peoples. But more often than not, man simply elevates himself to the place of God. The word change there in those verses where it says they, that, they, uh, that they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. That word changed really means to exchange, to trade or substitute one thing for another. So they've, they've exchanged the image of the true God for the false God that they've created in their own image. And now that we've seen this, let's look at what happens when corruption of God has set in. And see what the devastating effects of God's judgment is at that point. Notice what the Bible says in verses 24 and 25. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. And worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. God says here that God's judgment descends on a people when they corrupt the truth of God by worshiping the creation rather than the Creator. Notice first of all the manner of God's judgment. The Bible says that God gave them up. And we see that same Greek phrase in verse 26 and in verse 28 where it says that God gave them over. It's the same phrase. Now, picture with me, if you will, a rowboat that's being held in place against the raging current of a river by somebody holding on to a rope on the bank. The current's pulling the boat, trying to get it to go with the flow, but the strength of the person is keeping it from being carried away. That phrase here, God gave them up or God gave them over, means that not only has God let go of the rope, and let the boat be at the mercy of the current's edge. But he's pushing the boat into the swifter part of the current away from the shore. When men corrupt God's image and truth in order to continue in their sinful lives, the Bible says that God's judgment is to not only allow them to willfully sin, but he actively hands that nation over to their sins, and the devastating consequences that result. This passage tells us that at some point, a nation crosses a line. And when that line is crossed, God's judgment is to give them the desire of their heart while sending leanness to their soul. But now notice what the object of God's judgment is. It says He surrenders them to their lusts. Now, in this passage, the context is what the Bible calls lasciviousness. A surrender to the sexual passions where there's no longer the God-given constraints of purity before marriage and then marriage and then fidelity in marriage. Now, I'm going to make a bold statement here, but it's one that I, can, I believe I can back up. I believe we can look at this nation and see when God gave this country over to that first level of judgment, and that was in the 60s. Remember, 1962, the Supreme Court decision, Engel versus Vital, banned prayer in public schools. In 1963, the Supreme Court in Abington versus Shemp said that you could no longer open the day with prayer or devotional Bible reading. What happened from 65 to 75? The sexual revolution, or what we call, or what people have called the sexual revolution, and what God calls surrendering to their lusts. I believe that those two pivotal events are when America as a society crossed the line and God let go of the rope and gave our nation a push into greater consequences. So there's no doubt that America is under at least the first level of God's judgment. But now notice verses 26 and 27. For this cause God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. Once the body has been surrendered to natural lust, the Bible says that the next stage of God's judgment is a surrender to unnatural lusts. 
Of course, we know that what the Bible's talking about here is homosexuality. The Bible calls this vile affections or disgraceful passions. Now, think about what's going on right now in the United States. The Obergefell decision in 2015 legalized homosexual marriage in our country. And just this past week in Disney World, of all places, whole clothing sections were dedicated to the homosexual movement. I can't even begin to tell you how many homosexual couples and even one threesome that I saw in one uh, place of two men and a young woman that we saw while we were there. When a society openly celebrates what God calls an abomination, that's sure evidence that God has pushed the boat of the U.S. into the river currents of God's judgment. Now, let's look at the last stage. We've seen how ungodliness or anti-godliness leads to God's judgment when He releases a people to indulge in sexual immorality. But the third stage is where we see the unrighteousness, where it's men's evil toward other men. And that, that's where that comes into play. Look at verses 28 through 32. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. The Bible tells us here that God next gives people over to a wretched mind to do things that are not right towards one another. It's very similar to what the Bible describes regarding another group in Genesis chapter number 6 in verses 5 through 7 in the days just prior to the flood. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. When we look at what's going on in our country right now with man's hatred of man and, 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 and anarchy and chaos, and we look at Portland, we look at Seattle, we look at Chicago, and we see those cities burn in Minneapolis... Can we deny what's right before our eyes here in Romans chapter number 1? But what I want us to focus on is that last verse. What the Bible says is that as we move into that last phase of God's judgment, not only will we see an increase in unrighteous acts, but there will be a celebration when these things happen. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a time when you would have riots in a city and the leaders of that city or the leaders of that state would actually rejoice because of the destruction and the death and the damage and actually call out people who are wanting the violence to stop as being the real troublemakers. All we have to do is look around us and see that truly we're at least beginning down the slope of the third stage of God's judgment. We can look at the signs of the times and as Christians we can be excited because we do know that Christ is coming back. And I'm not saying we ought not to look forward to Christ coming back. But what we ought to be doing as Christians is looking at our society and not just focusing on the return of Christ, but also realizing the truth that God is judging our country and that it's as much a time of weeping as it ought to be a time of celebration. The message is clear. God is judging America. And we're in the beginnings of the final stage. So what can we do? 
what should we do? When we get back together and we start having some services in the sanctuary, we're going to be, I'm going to be sharing some things. I've been working on this a little bit anyway. But to help us with some of these things. But here's what we need to be doing right now. We need to pray for our country with a fervency like we've never had before. We need to pray for God to still use and raise up godly leaders who can help us to live as peaceably as possible, as it says in times like these. We need to pray for our families that, God, no, that not only will God protect us, but He'll use us to be salt and light in this country in the midst of all of this chaos. And we need to realize that with God's judgment of this country in full sway, that those we know who are lost will only become more embittered and harder to reach over time. So we need to be praying for their souls. And we need to be sharing the gospel with them so that even in the midst of God's wrath, we can still, still see evidence that God's mercy is still being displayed. That's the signs of the times. Yes, we can look around and see all of these things and say, Jesus is coming. But we also need to be, as Christians in America, we need to be looking at these things and realizing that God is judging this country and we're the salt and light and we are the ones with the message that can save people from hell and not just another bad event in a city or another bad administration or whatever it is. We need to be focused on the commission that God has given us as a church as we pray for the nation around us. Father, I've shared what you'd have me to share tonight to the best of my ability. So much more could have been said, but this is just where you said to stop. So Father, I pray that you would help us to pray as we've never prayed before. And Father, may we consciously look at those around us and pray not only for their salvation, but to pray for an opportunity to be a witness of the salvation that you've provided. For Father, our nation is truly under your judgment, and rightfully so. But you call us in the meantime, to be salt and light and to be your ambassadors to the darkness in this world. So help us to stand and having done all to stand. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for all that you do through us and in us and for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. I know this was a little longer than some of the messages in the past, usually on Wednesdays, but I pray that it was an, at least a challenge, uh, maybe an encouragement, but a challenge for sure, and that God will use this to help us be the salt and light that he would have us to be. Don't forget, uh, we're going to we're gonna take just a short break and then go right into prayer time on the, on the private channel, uh, so stay around for that if you're part of our church. Uh, and then on Sunday, we'll be getting back into our series, Come Unto Me, uh, Finding God's Peace in an Anxious World. Uh, and then on Sunday night, we'll be back in our series on the book of Acts. So just excited about getting back into all of those things. And then next Wednesday, we'll be returning to our Standing on Solid Ground, which is actually kind of a part of this. Being able to stand and share the truth of what's going on helps us to be that salt and light that God would have us to be. So just be much in prayer as we continue to look at this idea of social justice and what the Bible says about it and how we as Christians need to respond and, and how we need to be involved in those kind of things over the weeks ahead, okay? Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Like I said, give us just a short break and we'll be right back with prayer time uh, for those of you that are a part of our church on the private side of the channel, all right? God bless.